handoff has occurred. On September 9, 2006, Space Shuttle Atlantis launched STS-115 from Pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center for the first assembly mission to the ISS after the Columbia disaster and following the previous successful return to flight missions. The goal of the mission was to deliver the second port side truss segment, the P3, P4, and a pair of solar arrays, along with some batteries. And lift off of Space Shuttle Atlantis, opening a new chapter in the completion of the International Space Station for the collaboration of nations in space. World program. Roger, go, Atlantis. Houston is now controlling. Roll maneuver is underway. Atlantis is heading into a heads down position on course for a 51.6 degree, 137 by 36 statue mile orbit. Space Center at an altitude of 2.8 statute miles. Engines now at 72%, beginning to throttle back up as the vehicle passes through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Atlanta, Houston, go at throttle up. Copy. Go All three liquid-fueled engines are back at full throttle. One minute, 20 seconds into the flight. At liftoff, the fully-fueled shuttle, boosters and external tank weighed about four and a half million pounds. It now has burned half of that weight in propellant. Solid rocket boosters are burning 11,000 pounds of propellant every second. Coming up on uh, 1 minute 45 seconds, standing by for first stage uh, separation of the uh, solid rocket boosters. Atlantis is at an altitude of 129,000 feet, 24 miles in altitude, 25 miles downrange. All three engines are still performing as expected. SRB separation and staging confirmed. Moments after main engine cutoff, 8.5 minutes after liftoff, Crew members Tanner and McLean used handheld video and digital still cameras to document the external tank after it separated from the shuttle. That imagery, as well as imagery gathered by cameras in the shuttle's umbilical well, where the tank was connected, was transmitted to the ground for review. After the standard two-day rendezvous orbit, crew member Jet flew Atlantis through an orbital backflip while stationed about 180 meters or 600 feet below the station. This maneuver allowed the Expedition 13 crew to take a series of high-resolution photographs of the orbiter's heat shield. On September 11, 2007, Atlantis docked with the International Space Station. Almost two hours later, the hatch between them was opened and the crew was welcomed aboard. <laughs> Following docking, Ferguson and Burbank attached the shuttle's robotic cannon arm to the 17.5 ton P3 P4 truss. They then lifted it from its berth in the payload bay and maneuvered it for a handover to the station's cannon arm too. The 
the Canada Arm II positioned the truss in place. The first spacewalk for STS-115 was to assist the positioning and attachment of the truss. Following the installation of the truss by the ISS Canada Arm 2, Tanner and Stefyson Piper began their spacewalk to activate the truss. During the EVA, they installed power and data cables between the P1 and P34 truss, released the P3, P4 truss launch restraints, and a number of other tasks to configure the truss for upcoming activities. The spacewalk was so successful that the astronauts carried out a number of tasks scheduled for later EVAs called get-ahead tasks. A bolt, spring, and washer assembly from the launch lock was lost during these extra activities and floated off into space. On day five, the second spacewalk of the mission was conducted, this time by first-time spacewalkers Burbank and McLean. They devoted the day to the final task required for activation of the Solar Alpha Rotary Joint, or the SARJ. The SARJ is an automobile-sized joint that allows the station's solar arms to turn and point towards the sun. Burbank and McLean released locks that held the joint secure during its launch to orbit aboard Atlantis. Burbank and McLean spent 7 hours and 11 minutes outside the station. And in addition to the SARS work, they completed several get-ahead tasks during their time outside. As they worked, spacewalkers overcame several minor problems, including a malfunctioning helmet camera, a broken socket tool, a stubborn bolt, and a bolt that came loose from the mechanism designed to hold it captive. Day 6 continued the installation of the solar array. The unfurling of the solar panels themselves began a little up behind schedule due to a problem encountered on day 5 with the Sarge. This problem was determined to be in the software and a workaround was developed. The unfurling of the panels continued throughout the morning in stages to prevent the panels sticking as they did during STS-97. It was noted by the crew that some panels were sticking together, but this didn't cause any problems. Although the installation had been completed, the solar lays would not power the station until the next shuttle mission, STS-116. Flight Day 7 featured the third and final spacewalk of mission STS-115. During the 6 hour and 42 minute spacewalk, Joe Tanner and Heidi Stefassen Piper carried out numerous maintenance and repair tasks, including removal of hardware used to secure the P3-P4 radiator during launch. Ground flight controllers subsequently unfurled the radiator, increasing the ability of the station to dissipate heat into space. Also, completed during the spacewalk was retrieval of materials experiments from the outside of the ISS, maintenance on the P6 truss, installation of a wireless TV aerial, and the replacement of the S1 truss S-band antenna assembly. After the spacewalk, the crew moved the station's mobile transporter to a work site on the P3 truss, to inspect portions of that truss. The 
Day 8 of STS-115 was the last full day with Space Shuttle Atlantis docked to the ISS, and it was mainly spent in preparation for undocking procedures to occur on Flight Day 9. The crew spent the morning resting following their highly successful mission, and then began getting ready for the undocking by carrying out transfers of ISS equipment and science experiments into Atlantis to get ready for the trip home. Following the traditional farewell ceremonies, the hatch between Atlantis and ISS was closed and locked. On September 20, 2007, STS-115 crew returned to the shuttle and Atlantis undocked from the International Space Station. After undocking, Atlantis began its 360-degree fly-round of the expanded ISS to document the new configuration. Following the discovery of a co-orbiting UFO on Flight Day 11, flight controllers spent the early hours of the morning using the orbital's robotic arm to inspect the upper surface of Atlantis. The astronauts on board the orbiter are spending the rest of the morning scanning the underside of the shuttle for any areas of concern. Following these scans, the crew received word from Mission Control to use the orbiter boom sensor system to conduct more inspections of Atlantis's heat shield. Following the review of these scans, it was determined that there remained no safety issues with Atlantis, and mission controllers cleared the orbiter for re-entry. This clean bill of health, added to favorable weather forecast at the shuttle landing facility for Thursday morning, permitted Atlantis to be cleared for a landing the next day. The crew spent the remainder of the day in preparation for landing, packing up gear and stowing the KU band antenna for TV broadcasts. During the inspection, the crew was notified that Soyuz TMA-9 was docked to the ISS above, which carried the first half of the Expedition 14 crew. On September 22, 2007, the final re-entry procedures and landing took place during the morning, and numerous debriefs and conferences occurred in the afternoon. Ten minutes following the first detection of Atlantis, two sonic booms were heard at Kennedy Space Center as the orbiter dropped below the sound barrier three minutes prior to touchdown. Commander Jet took control of Atlantis a minute later, and with Kennedy Center runway 33 in sight, began bringing his ship in for landing. Atlantis' main gear touched down in runway 33 at the Space Shuttle Landing Facility at Kennedy Space Center, bringing mission STS-115 to an end.